So we'll continue on with inflammatory lesions uh, from before. So uh, Ashu, why don't you take this case? All right, so a 15-year-old um, male with shoulder and thigh pain. And it just looks like there's pretty symmetric diffuse edema throughout the, um, throughout the muscles. Um, there's some, I think there's, doesn't look like there's much fatty atrophy on the T1 sequences. It just looks like edema. Um, uh, it just looks like a systemic process. I don't, I don't think it's infectious. Oh, um, could you get, you know, I think I'm, okay. Huh. Wait a second. Uh, I'm sorry. The, the, yeah. Okay. Keep going. Um, so yeah, I was thinking of, because the patient's pretty young, if this is a, you know, um, a diffuse congenital myositis or uh, yeah. this is a myositis. A juvenile rheumatoid, a juvenile myositis, right. Okay. Okay. And this okay, so here we can see similar diffuse edema within the proximal thigh musculature, kind of symmetrically. Um, and it looks like there's no significant fatty atrophy, but it looks like there may be some enhancement on the post-contrast images. This can also be seen with dermatomyositis. Female general like in skin rash after herbal medication for 10 days. Yeah, okay. So you see like with the muscles of her, like her adductors, anterior, muscles of the thigh, we just see diffuse edema throughout bilaterally, fairly symmetric with sparing of the hamstrings and some of the adductors. So like similar to the other ones, you know, some sort of dermatomyositis, especially in some as a rash as well. Hey, Ashu. All right, so this is a 67-year-old female with pain after radiation for colon carcinoma. Um, you can see significant edema throughout both adductor musculatures, um, not, no significant fatty atrophy on the T1 sequences. Um, and since this patient had recent colon carcinoma radiation, um, just, just the radiation derived myositis. Yeah, I think this is pre and post contrast. We don't see a lot of enhancement. Yeah, so this is radiation-induced myositis. And you really shouldn't see this very often anymore. The current radiation technologies are typically uh, tomographic, really, and they they uh, they really are very good at targeting the tissue that you want and not getting a lot of radiation exposure to the surrounding tissues. Okay. We have a 33-year-old male IT consultant with a recent trip to the Philippines, gradual onset, lower back pain, progressing to the buttocks and legs, fever, no TB contact, started antibiotics June 15th, now he has pro progressive kidney dysfunction, worsening inflammatory markers, hypotensive episode. Okay, so there's diffuse intramuscular edema throughout the left proximal hip and thigh musculature. It's multiple, multiple compartments. Yeah, multiple. But there's also, on that last image, there's some less extensive edema on the, is that on the right side or is that just a little lower on the bottom image? It looks like there's also some in the right side, uh, which makes me think this is something more systemic, but greater on the left than the right. I guess with his decreasing renal function, this could be, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, elevated CK levels or myonecrosis, um, diffuse myositis. Necrosis. Can I think of this? Uh, his WBC count is elevated. He has elevated neutrophils and eosinophils. CRP is elevated and his CK is elevated. Um, 
suppurative inflammation of the gluteus minimus. Um, autology inflamed skeletal muscle with epithelioid cells, no fungal or bacterial growth, and his peripheral blood cultures were negative. Um, he improved all in broad spectrum antibiotics. That's weird. Yeah, I thought that was just, um, yeah, some kind of myonecrosis. Um, like elevated creatinine kinase levels. Okay. Yeah. A five-year-old female with acute onset of severe hip pain. Along the greater trochanter, I see this hypo-intense density with surrounding edema, kind of where the gluteus medius minimus attachment went. I'm wondering if this, this is just like calcific tendinitis? Okay. Yeah, sure. Um, 71 year old female, right hip pain for one day. Um, I see some calcification near the, uh, right there. Yeah. I'd be worried about some calcitic tendinitis. Um, the rectus femoris. No, it's, it's definitely more inferior. Yeah. It looks like it's gluteus. Uh, yeah, gluteus minimus uh, inflammation there, so I'd be worried about some calcific tendinitis. Uh, okay, so it's kind of affecting all of those regions. Um, superior gemellus. Okay, so a lot of edema within all those muscles. Um, I think these look pretty normal to me. Quadratus femoris. Piriformis looks pretty symmetric. Yeah. Yeah, quite a bit of edema, and you see that um, focal low signal focus on the MRI. So and, hmm, looks like calcitic tendinitis. Yeah, so here are all those muscles that come in. We, we didn't go through detail because uh, you, know, you just go through detail and you forget it. If you generally need to know it is uh, I, I tend to look it up if you need individual muscles but I think we're all familiar with there are multiple muscles here so you have really fine control over the hip and this is calcific tendonitis primarily the superior gabellus muscle with a lot of edema going to the others again I, I think these are predominantly traumatic injuries <laughs> female with non-draining ulcer and familial Mediterranean fever. Uh, I see just sheet-like calcifications throughout the soft tissues of the right thigh. Uh, and then here on the MRI, we can see those low signal intensity foci compatible with calcifications within the anterior and posterior thigh musculature. Um, Well, she has an ulcer, so I'm not sure if this is it infectious or myositis ossificans. A lot of potential causes of it, but generally it's something that, we, you know, that causes uh, inflammation in the muscle and the healing. You, you get calcium pyrophosphate deposition into the muscle, which can then become really uh, almost cortical-like calcifications. And you, you can uh, commonly see it after surgery if you don't have good mobilization or even with good mobilization, especially around the hip. So that's why uh, typically with uh, a lot of hip surgeries, uh, they'll get uh, treated with with uh, one of the non-steroidals. Typically in the past, it was in methicin, but I think people find that the others are better tolerated and just as effective as in methicin. Okay, so we kind of had this almost like kind of a bilobe fluid collection or some heterogeneity and low signal intensity within it. Is this like in the uh, ileus? Oh, what is? 
coming down. Yeah, the adductor. Um, this looks like it could be blood products like a hematoma from an injury, but this is, I guess, we're dealing with inflammatory. Uh, so is that the, so the hypo intensity is just uh, like calcific intensity? Yeah. Yeah. Some other mass isosificates. Yeah, they can look very mass like or sheet like. Okay, Ashu. Um, 43 year old female with palpable mass of the right buttock, onset two months ago. Um, a history of dial dialysis um, for the past six years. Um, you can see extensive calcification kind of throughout that right thigh, um, extending up through the proximal up to the right femur there. And um, looks uh, looks pretty heterogeneous, but it's kind of diffusely low signal on the T2s, a lot of inflammation there. Is this just another type of um, ossification? Is this just heterotopic ossification? Right. No. And it's, uh, these these are more common in people who are on dialysis, especially if they're not well controlled. And, and there's a list of different things they kind of think about when you see uh, a kind of calcification out in the soft tissues. It's a fairly long list. Uh, and there are grading systems looking at this, uh, but you know, I, don't, I don't think we need to go through that in, in depth. Okay, uh, older male with increasing hip. Uh, it looks like he may have some preferential fatty atrophy of his left gluteus medius muscle. I can't tell if that's an enthesophyte along the greater trochanter or if that's just the slice. Um, four months later. So this is this at the time that the patient presented with increasing hip pain. You're talking about the edema, right? Yes. I couldn't tell if that was fatty atrophy or edema. Now on the new study, he has rapidly progressive edema and joint space narrowing along the superior hip. So I wonder, I'd like to see his plain films. Um, and here again on the new study, we can see diffuse edema throughout that right femoral head and some superior joint space narrowing and some early osseous remodeling there along the anterior superior femoral head. Yeah. This is just rapidly progressive degenerative disease. Um, aspiration pyrophosphate. Okay, so they this may be due to CPPD deposition disease since he has pyrophosphate crystals or pseudo gout. That's what it's called. So how does how does pseudo um, well the I know it causes crystal deposition in the cartilage the articular surfaces, and then that leads to rapid joint space loss. Yeah, I'm not sure that that's what a lot of people think. That the pyrophosphate crystals cause the disease. I, I think that it's more likely that this patient had trauma at this particular time, had a muscle strain, probably injured the bone, but we're not picking up the bone injury yet. And then now we're picking up the bone injury, and he has been progressive uh, fracturing of the bone and loss of cartilage due to the subchondral bone fractures, uh, which then, and then we can see all this remodeling as time progressed. And then uh, once you develop degenerative disease like this, you get flakes of pyrophosphate that, that come from the bone that go out into the surrounding soft tissues. So uh, maybe the calcium pyrophosphate causes the it actually doesn't cause a lot of inflammation. Uh, maybe it does. Uh, <clears throat> but my guess is that actually uh, what CPPD disease is, is primarily a traumatic injury. And the crystals actually come from the injured bone and are a marker of bone injury rather than an active agent in the, in the process of the disease. But that's very controversial. 
Chronic hip pain um, on the right hip. I see like some kind of calcific type density uh, overlying thermal head neck trunk and that's kind of protruding out. Um, so that looks like it might be calcified kind of along the joint capsule almost it looks like because it looks like there's a little space here and so now we see this kind of bony density right along the anterior aspect of the joint um some sort of like it looks like some sort of heterotopic ossification or either ossification of the ligament um it's actually bright on this fat set stir imaging So th this again was CPPD disease. And uh, my guess is that this is a, a lot of calcium deposited in a thick and partially, uh, chronically partially torn capsule. Yep. So we can move on to inflammatory arthropathy. Uh, talk a little bit about lupus, ankylosing spondylitis, and then some foreign body type diseases. Uh, Ashu, what do you think of this case? Um, so we're looking at uh, T1 sequences. There's actually extensive low T1 signal of the acetabulum, uh, acetabulum uh, ischium right there. Um, I, I don't know. I'd kind of be worried about malignancy. But, um, yeah, increased signal in the PD fat sat. Um, almost like a serpiginous high signal here. Like, well, it could be an infarct, could be infection or sinus tract. Um, but I feel like it. I feel like it could be. Um, uh, I'd like to see it in multiple planes if possible. And then there's also partial tearing of gluteus medius bilaterally. But um, so this was a patient who had lupus, and this turned out okay. to be not malignant, but an infarct from lupus erythematosus. And typically, with lupus, you'll see multiple infarcts. Uh, let me call John again and see what's why he can't get on. Just a second. Okay. All right. Uh, uh, this is a 30 year old male with sacrococcygeal pain four months after injury. Um, you can see on the three years ago when he was 27, he had some increased signal. Oh, okay. And then here on the stir images, he has a mild increased signal along the anterior superior end plates. Um, this be sh shining corners. Ankylosing spondylitis. Be seen with early ankylosing spondylitis. Here's the top six. Okay. So now here we have some edema surrounding the right sacroiliac joint and also um, along the left sacroiliac joint. Looks like perhaps some early ankylosis on the left. This can be seen with ankylosing spondylitis. Um, that's the calcification of the posterior longitudinal ligament. 12th uh, of the uh, joint between the rib and the and the vertebral body, uh, which is common in ankylosing spondylitis. So, so if we go back again, oops. OK. 
case. Uh, here's the first one, and th these are kind of non-specific findings. That's though you you typically don't see them in in people this young, but these could definitely be degenerative changes, and and I've seen these with degenerative disease even in teenagers. Uh, but with back pain in younger people, especially males, you, you really have to be hyper vigilant about uh, uh, ankylosing spondylitis because it's something that really needs to be treated, hopefully in the teens, uh, where you can make the diagnosis with MR uh, because you want to get it before it progresses. And in a situation like this, if you've got a plain film or a CT, you might start seeing these syndesmophytes, which you really can't see very well on an MR scan. Okay, but this was uh, ankylosing spondylitis. Okay. Michael. In 19 year old, I treated by orthopedists for two years in a row for low back pain, now three months bilateral hip pain. Um, so. On the first, on just the static images of the spine, I don't know if I see too much from here. Here, you know, with this history, you'd be concerned for ankylosing spondylitis, and I know you can get ossification of the the lumbar um, iliac ligament. That's later, which that's what I was kind of trying to look. Yeah. I was trying to see if you're trying to show that ligament ossification. I don't see it, and I don't really see the sacrum is a little bit of sclerosis, but I don't see too much. The joint spaces look pretty. Yeah, they look pretty like well maintained. So on the MR, now you can see that there's a periarticular edema involving both of the SI joints, the left predominant, the iliac bone, the other one, and the sacrum and the iliac. Um, and there's also some signal within the uh, femoral heads. So you have like a bilateral sacroiliitis that you're not going to really see on plain film. So we recommended a rheumatology test. Okay. Spondylitis. So uh, this is really at the stage you want to treat it uh, before you start getting uh, uh, limitations of motion and uh, irreversible. Uh, changes of ankylosing spondylitis, and before you have a lot of erosive bony disease. So, uh, uh, how, how do you make the diagnosis? Well, there, this, this is actually changing now nowadays, but uh, you like to see sacroiliitis on imaging plus one spondyloarthropathy feature, uh, also or HLA B27 with two spondyloarthritic features, age less than 45. In this day and age, we really should make this diagnosis before age 20. Age 45 is really going to be end-stage disease. And the spinal arthritic, uh, arth arthritic features, spinal arthrosis features that you're looking for are inflammatory back pain, uh, inflammatory arthritis and other joints, heel enthesitis, uveitis, dactylitis, psoriasis, Crohn's or ulcerative colitis, response to NSAIDs, family history, HLA-B27 positive, and elevated CRP. And, and these diseases would be that you're looking for uh, not just ankylosing spondylitis, but Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis are in the differential. Psoriatic arthritis is in the differential as well. So those are the, the, the really the diseases that you're looking for. And uh, typically if, with ankylosing spondylitis, if you look for the disease with MRI uh, and or, or uh, think about the disease, you'll typically detect it about 10 years before you're ever going to see x-ray findings. So if you're thinking of ankylosing spondylitis and you've waited to make the diagnosis on x-rays, you're really not doing your, your patients a favor. Um, one thing that hasn't been mentioned is measuring the chest expansion. It has to be more than half an inch. If it's less than half an inch, you can almost bet it's ankylosing spondylitis or old age. Yeah, and that's because the the joints between the, the joints between the ribs and the vertebral bodies are early are involved early in the disease, just like the sacroiliac joints are. And when those joints oh, are involved, and every time I examine that back pain uh, in my career, it, I, I measure the chest. That's one of the um, 
same size as the size measuring leg circumference for back conditions. That's part, part of the exam. Now, now these uh, the doctors examine the bag by looking at it and then sending for an MRI or an X-ray. It's uh, it's it's not done very well. Uh, in case you guys want to know, I don't know what 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 you learned in school, but uh, uh, what I see now is uh, doctors are not examining patients like they. They did not pass to get information. They send patients for x-rays because they don't have time to examine them. Right. Uh, okay, so in this case, on the image on the, the stir sequence, we see bilateral uh, SI joint edema, predominantly in the sacrums. On the T1 rate image, you see like hypointensity, like compatible sclerosis. So concerning for like maybe kind of like an acute on chronic sacroiliitis. And now we see there's bony bony changes actually so maybe widening of the joint space on the right at least so def yeah and like yeah bony irregularity all, all throughout the joint so it's kind of acute and chronic sick early uh, we can cause some spondylitis in this case okay Ashu. all right this does not look like enclosing spondylitis um looks like there's uh t1 is kind of homogeneous so t2 Sequences, I think there's just multiple, like, I don't know, synovial nodules, maybe. I don't know if this is extending from the hip joint. Patient has a his, uh, shows a hip, hip replacement on the right side. Um, these are more focal. I, I'd be worried about synovial chondromatosis. Um, uh, uh, inflammation from a particular matter. That's the first yeah, thing. That's true, of. yeah. Yeah, so maybe these are precursors of, uh, <clears throat> well, I think you can call this synovial chondromatosis. <clears throat> uh, the, uh, under, when these are biopsied, they're, they're really inflammatory nodules or synovitis, and it comes from chronic inflammation, but they could probably progress to <laughs> chondroid lesions over time. Uh, but <clears throat> this is due to kind of a chronic uh, foreign body reaction with some of the older type. Uh, metals that were used in prostheses. Even polyethylene uh, in the old days used to wear away and, and, and cause foreign bodies, as you remember, John. Uh, right. yep. and now, now the polyethylene is uh, hardened to a point where it, uh, it doesn't wear very well, uh, which is great. Yeah, I've been uh, a long time. Now they're using a ceramic uh, prosthetics uh, that are supposedly better than the steel and so on. I'm not 100% sure that's true, but that's what they say. Ceramic is in. A 53-year-old male with bilateral shoulder and posterior thigh pain for two weeks. Eight months ago, he had neck pain, weakness, and now he's had weight loss. Um, I see some increased signal at the bilateral gluteal tendon attachments. Looks to me like this could be some tendinosis. I'm not sure if this is also, oh, also at the iliopsoas attachments to the lesser trochanter. Um, so this could be something systemic. He also has some bilateral hamstring origin tendinosis. Um, so he has some type of, I guess, enthesitis. Um, and here in the shoulder, he has increased signal at the rotator cuff attachment, supraspinatus, and also kind of diffusely throughout the rotator cuff, maybe subscapularis as well. Um, mm -hmm. uh, okay, thank you. The important thing, I think, is to get it in the right category. Systemic inflammatory disease, and then let the rheumatologists work it out. Okay, so certainly all bilateral thigh pain. Okay, so there's edema fluid signal, I think, at the distal attachments of the uh, at the 
the uh, gluteus maximus bilaterally, right, posterior to the femur. So some kind of either tendinosis or inflammatory uh, uh, inflammatory process. And it's going to be like just another case of polymyalgia rheumatica. Okay, Matthew. 59 year old female with right lower leg mass for five years, no pain, no tenderness, increased size on um, plain films. Um, looks like a pretty well defined um, focus of calcification near the tibia. Um, doesn't look like it's within the bone. Um, yeah, it looks like it's 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 pretty low signal, but pretty it's. Fairly heterogeneous, has increased T2 signal. Um, it doesn't really enhance. Um, and it just looks like, you know, some chondroid calcification. It could be some heterotopic calcification. I'm not quite sure. So this was removed, and this was a hemangioma. It had a lot of thrombosis and calcification in the vessels within the hemangioma. OK. Yeah. This is long-standing renal failure. We have coronal images of the bilateral hips with these large uh, soft tissue signal intensity deposits kind of surrounding the bilateral hip joints and their mostly intermediate signal intensity. I think this is um, renal osteodystrophy or calcific tumoral calcinosis. There's erosions as well. This could be seen with tumoral calcinosis. Um, here again, we see these intermediate and low. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there's some osseous erosion of the bilateral femoral heads and necks. Amylodosis. Thirty-year-old male, uh, back pain and left sciatica. So I think the arrow is pointing to the piriformis. Is it just? It's just maybe it's just showing that the left piriformis is asymmetrically enlarged compared to the right, which may be compressing the sciatic nerve. Then, so just piriformis syndrome. And I don't know what to say about this. There's, this is really very much debated as to some people believe it doesn't exist, other people believe it's very common and uh, misdiagnosed all the time. Uh, there were, used to be a local surgeon here in LA who made a career of diagnosing this syndrome and telling the world that every other doctor was uh, missing it. Uh, so, but but I, I'm just not sure. Uh, I, I don't, I really haven't seen it very often in clinical practice so I, i'm just not uh, sure about it uh, the thought being that it's asymmetric it produces mass effect compresses the sciatic nerve and then you get radiculopathy uh, down that side uh, due to the piriformis so other people say you can also get other muscles hypertrophied besides the piriformis which can do a similar uh, uh, can do similar compression of the sciatic nerve. It's just the piriformis is the most common. So you kind of look for asymmetry of the piriformis muscles, try to follow the sciatic nerve, and then see whether you can see compression or uh, swelling or uh, abnormal signal intensity within the sciatic nerve. Uh, I'm, uh, I, I just don't know how common this is. I certainly... Uh, I've I, never seen a case. I, I've thought about the diagnosis a couple of times, but I don't think in clinical practice I've ever seen a case that's actually ended up being documented as piriformis. And I've been involved in a number of medical legal cases where I felt that that wasn't the case. But anyway, this is the piriformis syndrome. You'll certainly hear about it uh, because there are people who really... Uh, uh, 
believe it, and uh, some people believe it's just asymmetric hypertrophy due to some sort of a training, abnormal uh, asymmetric training is one possibility. And the way people sleep and, and the way they um, sit on a toilet, etc., all kinds of things happen to the sciatic nerve, uh, not necessarily due to uh, one particular muscle. Yeah. It, 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 um, uh, every patient I've ever had where I thought about something like that uh, got well all the time. Okay. <laughs> Or when someone took a chiropractor or something. I don't know. Okay. I've never seen a case. Yeah. Uh, let's see who's next. Okay, a 26 year old female with pain along the path of the sciatic nerve. Um, here we can see kind of a Increased signal intensity along that exiting, it looks like S1, it's a muscle, okay. I'm sorry, look at the nerve. There's edema. Acute swelling of the, of the piriformis muscle, one would be if you have a piriformis injury, a muscle tear, especially a grade one, grade two muscle tear. Uh, the other could be if it got infected and you can get inflammatory disease. Both of those could then cause irritation of the adjacent piriformis muscle, but that's extremely rare. I mean, I'm in the adjacent uh, sciatic nerve, but that's extremely rare. But here we can see asymmetry and edema uh, within the muscles. And uh, this was thought to be a piriformis syndrome due to inflammatory disease of the and swelling of the piriformis muscle. Eighty-seven-year-old male, right lumbar sacral and leg pain. Eight long. Okay. Oh. Pretty severe. Okay. Um. Okay. So we see a lot of uh, signal and edema involving. I believe that's the right piriformis. Um, like quite a bit. Um, but I don't see the, all the fibers look grossly intact. Um, and it's very asymmetric compared to the left, so you'd, you know, again, piriformis syndrome. Uh, these are cases that were sent to me. Piriformis. So certainly if you see that kind of asymmetric inflammatory disease, then that's something that's probably real. Uh, Ashu. Um, so 21, a uh, 20 year old male with right hip pain for uh, two years. Um, on the ultrasound imaging, we see um, a hypochoic focus with some peripheral vascularity and the defect of the anterior fascial wall of that muscle anteriorly. Um, on the T2 fluid sensitive sequences, it's more cystic, almost looks like a lymph node. Um, but uh, it kind of extends into the muscle. I, I, I don't know if this patient had a recent injection or had some trauma here. Could it just be a Oh, nine months later, increased size and pain after trauma. Um, I, it almost looks like, uh, you know, it's kind of complex now. Um, there's There, again, is some peripheral vascularity. I kind of would, would be concerned about, like, a focal abscess. Yeah. Um, uh, right. Uh, this, this was biopsied, and it was all inflammatory tissue, so it got the diagnosis of nodular fasciitis. Okay, we have left hip pain. Um, it looks like there's some mixed lucency and sclerosis in that left ischium and left femoral head. Uh, it doesn't look like just bowel gas. Um, and then here we have the bone scan and there is some increased uptake throughout that left ischium. Um, so I'm wondering if this could be Paget's. So here we have the MRI. We have just cortical expansion and 
kind of mildly increased stir signal and T1 hypointensity throughout that left ischium, thicken tubercula. I don't see an, um, yeah, soft tissue mass. I'm gonna lift hip pain and sciatica for five months. Um, I'm not sure if the look. You know, I really don't see too much in the left femur itself. But now, so on the T1 weighted images of the lumbar sacral region, there's marked like fatty fat signal within the marrow of the sacrum. And as well as you can see, it fat saturates out. And now when I look back on this one, you can kind of see it's like pretty lucent compared to the the rest of the bones. Um, and so on this, you know, similar, we've got some striation. Some of the things about other bones and other, other limitations or other conditions. Okay. So again, you're seeing a thick intervicular bone as well. And, and uh, by x rays, you can get the lytic phase, mixed phases, and then chlorotic phases. And uh, with, with MRI, you can also see variations in signal intensity depending upon whether it's an inflammatory area or kind of chronic area. And in the end stage, you tend just to get a lot of uh, fat deposition. Um, what test would you do to make a diagnosis of that serologically? Anybody? Michael? Yeah, I don't remember. Michael doesn't remember, John. Alkaline phosphatases, sky high and ankylosing spondylitis. Ashley, what do you think of this case? I mean, not not ankylosing spinal. I'm Patrick's is right. I'm sorry. Right. Um, so, 39 year old male, history of bilateral hip replacement five years ago. Left some aromatic break, break with a revision two years ago. Um, um, so we see two um, two plane radiographs here from June of 2006 and October of 2006. And uh, I well on the, along the left, yeah, at the head there's some calcification or um, along that medial aspect of the uh, prosthetic device. Um, okay, so now we're going through October, um, November into 2007. Um, well, definitely on July 2007, you can see that extensive calcification at the Femoral, um, femoral neck junction there, um, and you can see the the difference uh, between March and uh, July. Um, and given that this was okay on the MRI, it's tough to see. There's a lot of hardware artifact, much more prominent on the left side, um, almost like it's eroding through the soft tissues. There um, is this just metallosis. That's what it looks like. So this is this is all a breakdown of the metal and little pieces of metal, and it almost looks like motor oil here. But it, they're all uh, magnetic, so you get signal loss in this area, and this is metallosis. And you see a lawyer just to advertise uh, on a regular basis in California yeah. uh, for this, uh, but they don't do that anymore. I guess uh, orthopods stopped using it that particular. Yeah. Combination uh, uh, metal on metal. Uh, we stopped using that years and years ago. It used to be called McKee Ferrar prosthesis that came after Charnley's prosthesis with the polyethylene and steel. Uh, once they went to metal metal, uh, that didn't last very long, uh, and uh, for 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 this reason. Um, but that was all over the world. People were using metal on metal. And then they found out that it just uh, didn't work that way. Yeah. They couldn't make it uh, smooth enough to to last. Yeah, I haven't seen it in quite a while. Well, I, I think Johnny stopped using it. Yeah. Um, 
however, if you look at Campbell's, um, it's it's still used. Okay. Um, and uh, a lot of folks that still think that that's a good idea. And I, I talked to a guy in, in the practice in California, retired at her early age, uh, maybe because he inherited money or whatever, but uh, it's, um, but he he was using metal on, on metal and he said everything was just great. Okay. So things we think about when we do imaging of the, uh, of the hip with the prosthesis in, try to use some sort of metal artifact. Uh, there, there are fancy sequences which you can buy, which at high field can be so, somewhat helpful, and nothing is really perfect. Uh, typically, for a lot of our scanners where we don't have those techniques, we'll use a stir technique, which is relatively insensitive to metal artifact. And then you, you look for osteolysis of, uh, of uh, the bone being resorbed, synovitis, uh, infections, obviously, hemarthrosis, fracture, loosening of the prosthesis, heterotopic ossification, tendinopathy, and neurovascular impingements, uh, which you can get uh, the metal on metal. We can see metallosis like we just saw in that last case. Uh, you get AVN of the bone around it, and then you can get aseptic lymph uh, lymphocytic vasculitis, AVAL, where you get soft tissue masses around uh, around the hip. I think I may have a case of that here. Well, let me go. Next, uh, okay, let's see. Uh, Jennifer, are you next? Okay, uh, which, oh, uh, of the studies, well, so the question is, uh, what MR findings in these patients correlate with pain? And uh, the positive correlations have been seen with increasing bone marrow edema, edema, abductor tendon tears if you have it, uh, but if you have pseudotumors or uh, masses like that, uh, that does not correlate uh, with pain. It's more the bone edema. And then you can get a lot of reasons for synovitis uh, that you look for, typical synovial thickening. If you give contrast, you'll get enhancement of the synovial thickening, and then you'll get increased effusions and uh, cystic uh, masses uh, around the joint space to look for. Here, why don't you take this one? 64-year-old male with pain two months after hip replacement, and it looks like we can see the susceptibility artifact associated with the right hip prosthesis. And there is some intermediate signal within that right acetabulum I'd be concerned about um, loosening or erosion. Um, there's intermediate signal also surrounding that right prosthesis. And then here, when we have the stir images, we can see that corresponds to fluid, large fluid collection within the right adduct. Um, Enter thigh musculature and some intermediate signal intensity. This could be metallosis or alval. Well, metallosis usually get larger as you go across signal loss due to the okay. susceptibility. And then I guess the this would probably be more consistent with alval. Oh, it looks like there's some rim enhancement on the post-contrast images, so that makes me lean more towards infection with some abscesses. Uh, but the loosening is something you have to worry about. Yeah, that was the problem I identified. Loosening is a because there's a susceptibility artifact, you try to look for fluid along the edges of the prosthesis. Uh, sometimes, sometimes plain films are actually to help with that. You also get a lot of artifacts in the CT. Methicillin resistance is there for you. And, and, and um, in a two month period, uh, usually uh, wear and tear will not cause that problem. So you have to start thinking about. Right. Exactly what you have there. Staph warriors, which can come on years after the fact. Well, not on my case, of course. Somebody else's. Okay, so hip replacement nine years ago, pain for two months. 
So we see a few focal areas of really low signal intensity, which I'm wondering is a it's just this metallic artifact in general, like with, yeah. So as we keep going, we've got multiple areas of metallic artifact, and uh, I don't know if that's just poor reduction or if there's actually like similar like a metallosis. Uh, I think this is all just metal artifact from the prosthesis. Okay. Let's and see if there's something there that's that. Um, so, I mean, we're looking at the greater choke in turn. This is pointing to, um... Yeah, that's what osteolysis looks like. So here we can, we, we've destroyed the bone here next to it. Uh, and that's the type of disease can be seen in, if you have loosening uh, and, and motion of the, of the prosthesis. But it's usually uh, inflammatory changes there. Uh, but if we continue to look here, we can see other things. Okay, so on uh, fluid sensitive sequences, we see this large irregular, like, paraticular fluid collection with really thick walled, hypo intense, like, uh, thickening of the walls, like synovial thickening. So that could be something also like an alveol type lesion. Uh, producing uh, uh, osteolysis of the bone as well as a large uh, inflammatory cyst collection. Uh, okay. Uh, the body hates foreign bodies. Ashley, what do you think about this case? 48-year-old female with pain after prosthesis. We're looking at the right hip. There's a lot of fluid collections around the prosthetic device, um, both along lateral and uh, medial margin. Um, there's, it looks like almost some irregular uh, ossification there as well. Um, I don't know if this. I'd like to see a few more sequences, but um, kind of yeah, it kind of looks like there's a bony like a, a lot like of a, erosion there. Hmm. We're looking at the stir in the T1. That's at post contrast images, and we can kind of see like it's it's growing into the. To ilio, uh, the iliac wing there, um, it looks mostly cystic. I, I don't know if this could be an infection um, after. <laughs> One thing to look at is the age, 48. That's a little early for a prosthesis. Oh, yeah. And Why so, is it prosthetic, I guess? And so wear and tear would be the first thing I would think of. Mm -hmm. uh, this, this oh, osteosarcoma. Okay. Turned out to be an osteosarcoma. That, that, that's not my uh, cup of tea, John. I mean, by that is that I'm not an expert in that right. department. Right. Yeah. Just, just have to remember that just because you have a prosthesis doesn't mean you have some of the other, uh, don't have some of the other uh, bone diseases. So aval is asexual vasculitis, uh, and it's uh, can have a lot of changes. What you typically see are synovitis, pseudocapsular dehiscence, adductor disruption, low signal deposits, a lot of places, soft tissue edema, lymphadenopathy, neuromuscular impingement. So, so but basically, with this, it's just a, a soft tissue inflammatory disease around the joint space. Yeah. Okay, uh, that's it. Yep. So we'll start a new topic tomorrow. Thank you. Yep. Have a good afternoon, everybody. Thanks, John.